Okay, guys, please have a seat. Uh, now we have uh, a woman with impact uh, who's going to talk to us. And uh, Katarina Mannheimer. Yes. Uh, she has a beautiful title for uh, this uh, uh, speaking point. Where my heart belongs. Yes. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you for having me here in Sundsvall at the Nordic Future Days. And I actually feel very Nordic because my father was Norwegian, my mother comes from Finland, I grew up in Sweden, I did my PhD in the United States, and uh, I spent a lot of my youth in Spain. So I feel that I have really, um, I'm a Scandinavian cocktail. So, and also my fiancé lives here in Sundsvall, so I spend a lot of time here. And um, I am here to speak about the art of developing consciousness. And actually, one would say it's nothing we really, re really need to develop because we're born with it. But that's something I'm coming back to in a little while. So my background is uh, traditional. I have a bachelor's in criminology. I started out at the University of Stockholm. And then I took a master's in social psychology uh, in the United States at the Portland State University. Later, I PhD'd in social work at the University of Chicago. My life was very much about achieving in the world. I was very, very identified with being an academic, with doing research, with being professional, with seeming intelligent. It was very, very important for me to have this type of identity, to be taken seriously, basically. And I worked uh, for eight years as a university lecturer at uh, the School of Social Work, University of Stockholm. I taught psychology and I taught research methodology, among other things. And um, I had never really had any clinical practice. So I wanted to learn how to become a therapist as well. Uh, due to a very deep personal crisis, I understood that knowing a lot of psychological theory did not do the trick. I completely crashed, which made me embark on a very deep therapeutical journey for myself. I was in therapy for 10 years. And I also went on a very deep and long spiritual journey. I traveled the world to meet with enlightened masters. I sat with masters from all kinds of traditions and especially um, a master that I really took to heart. Her name is Amma. And she stands for compassion. So compassion really became my passion. And also, um, you see, I also work today. I, I back up a little bit and say today I work as a therapist. I do work with hypnosis and I work with deep meditations. And I really want to help people heal. That's really my passion. So, I have been very fascinated, both for myself and as in my profession, uh, with the question of what makes us break. And what helps us repair ourselves if we do break? What makes us whole again? And what makes us live up to our full potential? What makes us thrive? And two things really come to mind. I work in a project with a, with a colleague. His name is Jürgen Tramberg. And he really points to the importance of choosing in, in as much as we can, choosing environments that support us. We cannot always choose supportive environments around us, but at least create an inner supportive environment so that we support ourselves, that we are kind to ourselves. Another word for that is self-compassion. It is becoming a good friend to yourself. Because if you think about how harsh we are, to ourselves, 
On an everyday basis, think about it. How many times a day do you tell yourself, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have thought that, that makes me into a bad person. I should not be who I am, right? So if we were as mean to our friends as we are to ourselves, we would probably be considered to be psychopaths or something along those lines, right? That's how bad it is. So have as supportive environments as you can. Choose partners and friends that are actually kind to you, that help you bloom. Because being with people that are open to us actually helps us relax. Our nervous system relaxes. We become still and we dare to uh, perform in our best, uh, to our best potential. When we relax, our heart and mind are in balance. They become in balance. There becomes a balance between the, the heart and the mind. We are born completely open-hearted. We are born, as far as I'm concerned, I think we are born enlightened. We come into this world completely open and with a natural ability to love ourselves and others. An open heart is vulnerable. It is grateful. It is trusting, naturally trusting and compassionate. We have a beautiful uh, potential for being compassionate. We are born that way. We are born actually kind and loving, but we're also born, of course, with a set of emotions. We are born with a perfect ability to feel all our emotions. We feel joy, we feel fear, we feel anger, we feel all our emotions. And as little children, we can handle this because the truth is that when we naturally let our emotions come through us, any single emotion will not last us for more than on average 90, 90 seconds. And then it's gone. You know, when you see, one of my teachers once said that when you see a child getting its diapers changed, a little baby, he or she can cry and be really, really angry and then comes a toy and they start laughing and then the anger is, is all gone. So we're born with the capacity of just shrugging away the emotions when they're done. And then sometime around three years of age or a little before that, through our socialization and through our attachment, we lose this natural ability because we understand from clues from the environment, we understand that, you know, it's not okay to react. And we also, what I think is a big deal here is that we, uh, we equalize feeling our feelings and acting on them because the only thing our feelings asks of us is that we feel them, nothing else. The fact that you're really, really angry doesn't mean that you need to hit someone. The only thing our feelings ask of us are to be felt. That's all. And if we let them happen, they will burn themselves up and they will leave our system. So this is how we are when we're born. And I believe this is from my studies, what I have been uh, looking at from both a psychological and a more spiritual philosophical viewpoint is that I think we are born with something that's called a soul. We can define it however we want, but it's part of us that is just like we've talked about today. We're all united, right? There's something that unites all of us. We are not separated. And we're also born with a core personality, you know, just like puppies. Some of us are a little more outgoing, some of us are a little shyer, some of us are a little more aggressive, others more laid back. This is how we come into the world. That's basically genetics. And we're also born with a very open heart, like I said, that is vulnerable and compassionate and trusting and 
and uh, humble in a way, just feeling, just being. We're, we're, we just are, and we don't judge our feelings when we're little kids. We just feel them. And then sometime around one and a half to three years of age, we start developing this thing that is called an ego. It has different definitions, but uh, I call it the ego. And the ego is actually a quasi-persona that we develop in order to make ourselves as different as possible from this, who we really are. It is actually the object of the ego to help us forget who we are. Because you, you have this personality, you know that you're maybe um, easily touched or you know that you uh, are a little shy or you know, whatever you are, you make the conclusion that this that I am, I need to be different. So we come into this world with a perfect sense of loving ourselves and being perfect. And then we realize that, haha, I'm not smart enough. I'm not brave enough. I'm not kind enough, maybe. I'm not, you know, nice enough, pretty enough, whatever. And I need to make myself into someone else. And what happens here is that we lose touch with who we really are. So, my passion and my quest, both in my own life and also in my work, is to really ask the question, who are you? We need to know who we are in order to have a genuine relationship with ourselves, And we cannot have a genuine relationship to ourselves if we don't know exactly what's going on. And like we heard earlier today, so you can call them bugs or you can call, call them negative um, um, habits, but we need to embrace all of what we are to be able to know who am I dealing with here? And what do I need, like my fiance often says, what do I need to tone up and what do I need to tone down in my behavior? And if I pretend that I don't have any of those things going on inside of me, I will not be able to deal with them. And sometimes I make the comparison to a computer, you know, you have this waste basket on your computer and you have some kind of reaction and as soon as your reaction comes up, you put it in that waste basket without even looking at it. And when that waste basket becomes so full of trash that you've never looked at, your computer becomes slower and it might even crash. So if we dare to go into that trash basket and read the documents, throw away the maps we don't need and keep the ones that we do need, that is actually a good way to live life. Just have no uh, secrets about yourself to yourself. Have a genuine, honest relationship with who you really are and all parts of it. There's nothing to be ashamed of. We're just humans and make the best of it. So we need to learn how to accept ourselves and how to be nice and kind to ourselves, at least as nice and kind as we are to others. And that is really, if we want to create a better world, we can't escape from ourselves. It has to start with this, like, uh, or oh, her name is on Lo Maria Katarina from Norway too. You have to start with yourself. That's where it all starts. And your true personality uh, harbors, actually, your real power and potential. Just like an actor, if you're playing a role, you're not as convincing as if you are your real self. It is very hard to be as convincing. So where you find your true power is always from the genuine core of your authentic self, of who you really are. And we are all unique, like we talked about earlier today too. All of us are unique, so find and allow for your uniqueness. Don't try to be someone else. If you have a talent for something, use that talent. That is your gift to the world. That's where you can contribute. If you're good at drawing, as, as far as you know, you know, just 
try to use it. Don't tell yourself, yeah, I shouldn't be good at drawing. I should do maths instead. So, ego, like I talked about, is an entity that is created to protect our core personality. Because an open heart is vulnerable and an open heart uh, feels that it needs protection. So no matter how enlightened you are, no matter who you are, you will have an ego just because you're a human being. That's what really dif differentiates us from the animals. Even animals have a sort of an ego, but it's not the same as the human ego. And our sense of identity is also located in this entity that is called the ego. And the ego have different forms and shapes depending on who we are. I've been working a lot with something that is called the Enneagram. It is a model for personalities uh, that was developed, I think, by the old Sufis once, uh, once upon a time. And it was used to actually um, see what what types of drives different personalities have. And certain personalities are more uh, approval-seeking, others are more safety-seeking, uh, and others are more control-seeking. And there's a really beautiful system that, uh, there's a lot of it on the internet too, you can Google it, the Enneagram. Uh, there's, uh, it's being, um, Stanford University has done some beautiful research on it as well, so. Um, I have looked at how our ego um, actually doesn't mean, when we hear the word ego, we often think that it means that we're inflated, but the ego is also all the things you do to shrink yourself or to inflate yourself, to make yourself uh, bigger or smaller or to protect yourself. So it's everything you do to protect yourself from the world or to survive in this world or to get what you want, or to keep what you don't want to lose. So ego is not who you really are. Your ego is all your strategies that are coming ultimately from fear of losing what you have or not getting what you want. Oh, three minutes left. Okay, I actually often think of the ego. Now the brain has many different uh, functions you have your reptilian brain and you have your decisions that you made in the, in the cortex. But I'm thinking um, of the ego actually is very similar to the left brain uh, because our left brain always compares. It is analytical, it likes details. It likes to, it's strategic, it likes control, it likes facts and while our right brain half is much more um, dancing, it's much, it has our intuition, it entails all sorts of qualities that are subconscious in many ways. And it's also a much more uh, creating and loving part of ourselves. And when these two parts of us become unbalanced, we become much more afraid because if we focus too much in the life the left side of the brain, we become much more fear driven. And a few years ago, I wrote a book. In Swedish, it is called Ditt hjärtat längtar om konsten att utveckla sitt medvetande. Uh, about the uh, art of developing consciousness. I started writing the book just completely from my creativity. I just wrote the core of this book in three weeks without even thinking a thought. I was sitting in my pajamas in my favorite chair and I basically didn't go out. And after three weeks, I looked at this book and I thought, shit, what did I do? Three weeks, that's awesome. And then I thought, but I have to put some theory into this. So I went back into my psychological theories and I looked at research and I was, you know, I wanted to give this some kind of um, credibility. And I moved into a much more fearful part of myself that, oh, do I really know what I'm saying here? Is this really true? Does research prove that this is true or not? Can I really say this? And in the end, I felt that I had a book that was written half of it with a left brain and half of it with a right brain. But it is actually a book that ties together psychological theory, my own journey, 
therapy on the spiritual journey. So, and, uh, and it is for sale here for 150 kroners. It's being translated to English now, but not done until the summer. So, anyway, um, here, I believe we create our future through our thoughts and through our actions. And what you believe about yourself deep, deep down, what you deep down believe about yourself will um, decide every choice you make. It will decide what friends you choose, what school you choose, what education, what work you choose, what environments you think that you belong in. So I believe to create a better future and a better world, the responsibility we all have to take is to make ourselves uh, acquaint, to know who we really are, what we are afraid of, and what we think about ourselves about ourselves deep, deep down. That is our responsibility. Not keep that a secret. And if it is a lie, which it often is, it is often a lie that drives us. You know, deep down we think we're not good enough, and that's pretty much universal, that we think we're not good enough. If we can do away with that lie, we will, come, we will become so much more compassionate, we will become so much more loving to ourselves and others, and we will not feel the need to put anyone down in order to feel that we're okay. That need will disappear. So, together we can co-create a better world, but it starts with actually being kind and loving and open-hearted with yourself. Be a good friend to yourself and you will be so wonderful to be around for others as well. And just um, like we said earlier here, that you cannot give what you don't have, like Maria Katarina said. And if you don't love yourself, you're not, if you don't accept yourself, if you're not compassionate with yourself, it's very difficult to be that to others too. So that is really our responsibility. And I wanted to say in the end here, because I looked at what has happened here today, it's so beautiful. We've been speaking about creating a human friendly society and, and love and passion and a happy future and authenticity and that children are the future. And when ki children are come into this world, they don't have this ego package that we, at least of my generation, most of us has, have created a really, really, you know, uh, challenging ego. So if we can help our children to not develop this backpack, we will be able to really create a beautiful world. So, thank you. Does anyone, does anyone uh, have a question to Katarina? This was a great message, I think, that, yes, Ray. This is all of our journeys, you know, to yes. realize who we are so we can bring our gifts to the world. And, um, you know, part of the narrative that we tell ourselves in society is that we, we get into this contraction mode, we protect. And what I heard from you and mm -hmm. I, what I know in my life is that great things happen when you realize vulnerability is strength. Yes. And that story, to tell that, you know, um, in my presentation earlier in, in the beginning, um, I came from a design uh, architecture background. Mm. And so my approach to sharing this vision was always technical. Like, look at this, look, this is how we can design this system, this is how we do this. And mm. I realized at the core of it is really our intention, what was driving it. Yes. And to kind of come into it naked and say, look, we're just all trying to connect to love and that's all it is. Mm -hmm. And then that we can fill in the technical blanks, you yes. know, uh, as we move forward. Yeah. But that thing, what you're speaking to, I think is so crucial because we really need to bring our gifts. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else has a comment or a question? It could be, you could share something as well. I feel it's more like a sharing moment. Yeah, yeah as yeah, well. Yeah. So you don't only have to ask questions. No. Mm. Yes, Jody. 
It is a vulnerable thing to set your boundaries, and some people don't realize that is sometimes the greatest love you can. Yes. And it's natural to some people. It has never been natural to me. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result, and particularly as a woman, it is hard to set your boundaries, and so you um, you d overdo it, or you. Yeah. So that's my journey. I'm learning mm -hmm. how to set boundaries in ways that empower mm -hmm. myself, but mm -hmm. empower others. I'm not very good at it. Mm -hmm. I know that's my work spot, mm -hmm. but um, so I offer that out as a yes. as a um, guiding light. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And boundaries are that's self love, you know. It's really self-love, treating yourself with, do I really want this? Am I comfortable now? And if that answer is no, honor it. It's hard, but it's really, really loving. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. Like you said, it's more like a sharing moment, but you talk about, we talk a, quite a lot about reconnection and to yeah. reconnect mm -hmm. it seems like a very technological word but I mean to reconnect with your inner resources and yes. reconnect with nature I think w one of the key things is not to think not to act just react mm. I think that's what the little baby is doing yes. not thinking so much no, just react to yeah be part of yes. nature and then just I have a favorite quote that Jan Elias on our former mm. foreign minister and deputy UN guy said without com without passion nothing mm. happens and we have heard quite a lot of nerds mm. today mm -hmm. but without compassion wrong things happen yes that is so true thank you that's very right both to ourselves and to others. Yeah. Yes, anyone else? Thank you so much.